Center on San Francisco State University campus. It is my absolute joy and pleasure to welcome you to an, a fantastic reading and evening with Kit Schluter and Cristina Rivera Garza. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Carolina de Robertis. I am an associate professor here at the Creative Writing Program at San Francisco State. And whether you are a member of our creative writing community or whether you are zooming in from somewhere else in the literary community or the world, um, a very round, warm, big welcome um, to our space and to our virtual version of our campus here at San Francisco State. Um, I have a couple of housekeeping announcements announcements before I introduce our first guest. Um, I want you to know that there is live captioning for this event. If you would like to see it, you can click on the bottom right word zone of your Zoom and you'll see it says CC for closed caption, live transcript, and you can turn it on and off there as you please. Um, we're so glad that that's available. And um, also there will be time for Q&A with the writers. One person will read and then the next person will read for a while. And then um, I will be in a brief conversation with both of our esteemed guests. And then there will be time to receive questions from the audience. So if you have a question brewing, if you'd like to propose one, please feel free to put it in the Q&A. Some of you may know this from being familiar with Zoom events in our pandemic era, era but please don't put it in the chat as it can get lost in there. Um, if you have a question, please put it in the Q&A section and then we'll be able to monitor that and hopefully include it in our conversation. So without further ado, I am so pleased and happy to introduce our very first guest, Kit Schluter, who is a poet translator and bookmaker living in Mexico City. His poetry and stories have appeared in a lot of places, including Boston Review, Bomb, Brooklyn Rail, Folder, Hyperallergenic, and in many chat books, among them journals, translations of forgetting, and five cartoons, Cinco Caricaturas. 
His first full length collection of poetry, Pierrot's Fingernails, was published in 2020 by Canarium Books. He's also a prolific translator from three languages French, Spanish, and Occitan, which is a language of Catalonia and southern France and other regions. Perhaps he'll tell us more um, if he wishes. And uh, his translations include books by Olivia Tapiero, Anne Kawala, Jaime Sáenz, Michel Surya. Uh, Julio Torri and many others with others also along the way. He has received a National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship in Translation, a Glasscock Prize, a Discovery Boston Review Prize, and he has an MFA in poetry from Brown University. He's also really active in literary community, co-editing for O'Clock Press, designing for Night Boats Books and Juan Malasuerte Editores. And he also, with Tatiana Lipkes, organizes a monthly reading series at Eromoto, a public arts library library in Mexico City. So, so many ways to be engaged with um, literary life. Of his collection, Piero's Fingernails, Peter Gizzi writes, the poems are at once romantic, antique, postmodern, gorgeous, and full with the sound of now. Kit's voice performs a kind of transverse for calling back is making it new. It's reassuring to read such depth of tradition becoming young again, speaking to today's world. So with all of that, please join me in welcoming Kit Schluter. Wow. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Carolina. Uh, thank you, Christina, Trey, Molly, who are the the backstage wizards making all this happen, Javier for um, the closed captioning, and uh, Steve for putting on this, this series. It's, it's an amazing series and uh, only getting better um, all the time. So it's crazy. There's so many people I know here from my dad to friends. Uh, and here I am jetsoning to you from my house. Um, uh, Carolina mentioned the Aeromoto series, which I ran with uh, Tatiana Lipkes. And uh, I just want to say this book is coming out. It has 68 poets who came to read at the library, um, about 35 Mexican poets bilingually presented, 25 poets from the United States, and about 10 more from uh, Latin America at large. So it's a uh, 460 pages of poetry and uh, prose presented in a completely bilingual edition. Uh, it was quite the mountain to climb, but uh, Gato Negro is putting it out with the National University of Mexico. And it will uh, be coming out from E.M. Wolfman in California as well. So uh, there are a lot of people I love and respect and really look up to in this book. And uh, I can't wait for it to get into your hands, but keep your eyes out for it. I'm going to be reading uh, Flying in the Face of Convention at the Poetry Center, three stories. Uh, they are from a collection I've been working on for a while now uh, called Cartoons. And the cartoon is a form of story that I've been kind of dreaming up and uh, writing through as a way to make writing fun uh, for myself, hopefully for readers for a while, uh, in which I take a sort of concern or a question uh, and consider its dynamics, the power dynamics or uh, various aspects, how they relate to each other. I blast the question apart into constituent uh, narrative uh, aspects like character, plot, event, and uh, I allow the question to kind of act out a theatrical version of itself, usually in a kind of um, exaggerated way, uh, because that way I can see it from very up close. And uh, I find it very therapeutic, uh, I admit. I do like treating writing as a sort of therapeutic uh, activity with a goal of overcoming certain problems. Uh, anyhow, I will be reading three. And the first one is called either 
the man with the bushes on his palms, or, oh, the bushes. Down in the city garden, there once lived a man whose palms sprouted unsightly protrusions whenever they got wet. And because they were made of his pale skin, these protrusions resembled heads of cauliflower. For as long as they lasted, they caused this man intense discomfort. But as soon as they dried, they withdrew entirely into his palms, leaving no trace of deformation. One day the man went to visit an old doctor who told him, intoning rather grimly, that he suffered an uncommon genetic error. With each appearance, these growths would not only augment in size, but leave increasingly significant traces of themselves on his body until they were the size of full-grown bushes, at which point, he continued, almost in a whisper, they would remain forever weighty and bulbous, even once his hands had dried. From that day on, the man became so afraid of water, he decided never to bathe again, not even in the stillest of waters, in the most tranquil of streams. Now, our story picks up at a time by which this man hadn't bathed in well more than a decade, and his body had become protected by a thick layer of earth. Whenever it rained, the surface of this earth would wet him, and all the little seeds that had blown onto it during recent times would blossom and shroud him entirely with ferns and moss, and the little sprouts that died and flitted away once he had bathed in the sun. In the early summer month of June, an unusually stormy weather pattern blew in over the city, bringing with it a rain that lasted for so long that not even the dirt encasing his skin could keep it from getting wet. There was no escape from the damp anywhere, neither in the garden nor under the bridges, nor, either, nor even in the nice apartments of Center City. He, like everyone in the region, spent a full month wet, so wet, in fact, that from each of his palms there sprouted a growth the size of a full-grown bush, just as the doctor had forewarned. And the earth upon his body sprang with such life that he blended indistinguishably in with the flora of the garden in which he lived. One morning of hot summer storm, the gardener of the commons came to tend to the plants, whistling and trimming, shaping and skipping until she came upon these big bushes, white like alien foliage glistening in the rain. Now, what are these ones? She asked aloud, and wherever did they come from? The gardener walked over and pressed her nose close to them and whiffed the air, and she peered at them from as close as she could, and she saw their surface, wrinkly and aquagenic, covered with countless little papules filled with what appeared to be water and marked with concentric ridges that brought to her mind the aching striations of growing fingernails. The gardener took out her shears and thinking only of ridding her grounds of this extraterrestrial shrub, took a great hack at its uppermost branches when much to her surprise, there discharged a great fount of red liquid and a voice seemingly come from beneath the soil cried, oh. The man with bushes on his palms shot up from the ground in such a way it looked as if the soil itself were thrashing. Howling in pain and hardly able to raise his arms for the weight of his hands, he shook the dirt from off his face and asked the gardener what in the world she was doing. And more importantly, why? Too stunned to reply, she shuddered backward in silence and ran off to her little house where she lived alone. That night, the gardener had a dream. In this dream, she had taken the earthen man into her house after snipping the evening away at the growths on his palms and neatly trimming all the plants in the soil on his body. And she let him sleep in her yard like a peculiar lawn ornament among the many rhododendrons and rose bushes, lilacs and pines that sprang up behind her home. And in this dream, the man had come to her door in the dead of night and asked her to cleanse him. She led him to a patch of moonlight and waited until he had dried, then tore the dirt from off his body, clump by clump, until it was covered only in a fine dust which she batted away with the blue handkerchief she wore around her neck until he was perfectly clean. Naked before her, 
The man struck her as beautiful. The dream continued with the day entire, coming and going as she gazed upon his body. His hair was fair and fell over his serious brow with light eyebrows at its edge. His eyes of pale green, such as algae in a shallow, sunlit, sylvan pool. His cheeks, high and strong, fit for the trim but bristling beard of blonde that covered the bottom of his face and concealed from her the crookedness of his teeth. His anatomy, strong and sculpted, was pleasing to the gardener, and she enjoyed it during extremely long moments. Then he looked toward her and, without a word, walked into her house. When, in this dream, she followed him in, night had once again fallen, and she found the man sitting at the circular table at the center of her dining room. Before him, on the table, in the dark, were a candle and a bucket of water. His skin glowed like wax in the near totalizing darkness, and she felt drawn to him as if by an invisible force, such as magnetism or gravity, but a force even stronger, warmer, more ineluctable and delicious than either of these. Where do you live? The gardener asked in this dream, and the man looked at her. And without a word, he said he lived in the garden she tended. And the gardener asked, how long have you lived there, hidden among the plants? And without a word, he said, for many years he had lived there, hidden among the plants. And the gardener asked, would you like to stay here with me, where there's food and drink, and at the very least, the company I could offer you? And without a word, he said that yes, he would love very much to stay there with her. And after sitting in a long and undistracted silence, during which the gardener stole an occasional glance at the man, she drew near him and asked him, do you know how it feels to be loved? And without a word, the man said nothing. And the gardener asked, do you know how it feels to be desired? And without a word, the man smiled, his crooked smile in the candlelight, and the dark night grew darker, more enclosed around them. And the gardener, slowly coming beside him, asked, do you know how it feels to be touched? And without a word, the man looked into her eyes for the first time and drew the bucket on the table nearer him. And without looking away from her eyes, the man plunged his hands slowly into the water. And as he craned his neck with difficulty and looked up at her beside him, peculiar forms began to grow from his palms, rhizomatic waxen protuberances that butted out in forking arrangements in the candlelight until he lifted them from the bucket without approaching the gardener who gasped and backed into a corner of the room watching the protrusions multiply until their weight pulled the man's torso toward the floor and he was made to kneel. And the man said, look at me. But the gardener could not find her voice to answer him. Without a word, the man said again, look at me. When the gardener awoke, she got dressed and walked through the city to the commons she tended. The sun was rising, visible for the first time in weeks, and hardly anyone was out and about yet. Only the day laborers with their hammers hanging acutely from their belts and the occasional man sleeping on a bench or walking off the alcohol still coursing through his veins from the night before. When she arrived at the garden gate, she bent down to cut the flower she would offer the man who had visited her in her dream as an apology for having cut him and having treated him with repulsion. She felt such regret, such terrible gnawing regret. Now, she saw the patch of earth where he lay, white, with the white forms arising amidst the bushes of green. And as she approached him, she sought the words that would make him forgive her. But when she drew near, she detected that all was still, all without the rising and falling of breath that denotes sleep. And she knelt down beside the mound of earth, and tearing the dirt off from off his face, clump by clump, until it was covered only in a fine dust, she found that in the night the ferns and moss had turned the corner of his lips and grown over his teeth and tongue 
and made their way down his throat. And from his mouth, there blossomed a bouquet of lilies, still warm with the air of his final staggered breath. Take the obligatory swig. The next story <clears throat> is called Parable of the Perfect Translator. And it has an epigraph from Virgilio Piñera, which says, it happened with great simplicity, without affectation. One early May afternoon at a cafe on Rue Scribe, a strange man presented himself to the university students as France's greatest translator. Yet, when these students looked into the name this man had provided them, they could find no trace either of him or of his work. The stranger lingered half an hour or so, and finding the students more interested in drinking with their young friends than in theorizing translation with some old stranger, went on his way. The following week on the same day, at the same time, this translator turned up at, a, at the student's cafe of choice on Bruce Scribe. This time, he said, he bore proof of his mastery. Setting a hideous briefcase on the table, he presented the students with a hardcover copy of Cuentos Fríos by Virgilio Piñera, as well as what seemed to be a translation manuscript into French in a folder labeled Conte Froid which even on quick inspection, the students determined was a complete handwritten copy of Pineda's same book in Spanish. All you did was write out the original, you hack. The 20 year olds protested, slamming their half liters of Carlsberg ale on the table. In this, you're mistaken, my fledgling scholars. What you're holding in your hands is a perfect translation. The students, not knowing if he meant this as a joke, talked forbiddingly, forbiddingly amongst themselves until the translator, unpossessed of the social graces needed to pierce the bubble of their exclusive conversation, left the cafe, not bothering to take with him either his book or his manuscript. Over the course of the following week, the three students who didn't consider the situation entirely ridiculous met to scrutinize the manuscript for divergences from Pineda's Spanish. But no, what they were holding did, as the others had said, in fact, appear to be a complete and faithful transcription. They puzzled over this artifact and too, even claimed to write this self-proclaimed translator off as a talentless psycho. But it would be unfair to his memory to say that all three displayed no sign of disappointment when the following week he failed to disappear or he failed to appear at the awaited hour. These three students and a couple poet friends who had nothing better to do with their lives could all be found waiting patiently at one, at two, at 3.30 and four, but by five their listless crowd did begin to thin out, mocked by the liquored up boasts of those who had called him a lowlife from the get-go. And by nine, only one student remained, leafing through the manuscript to find some trace of a reason to continue waiting some piece of contact information beyond a name which she might use to track the translator down when, much to her surprise, she found herself perfectly capable of reading Pineda's Spanish in the translator's hand as if he had written out the tales in French. Jo persisted as Jo, and yet it read to her like je, coche like voiture, sapato like chaussure, full sentences in this language, which moments before had been entirely without sense, now blossomed before her in all their complexity. The lone difficulty, or tedium, really, because what she wanted was to read on at full speed without hindrance, derived from the messiness of the translator's penmanship. Spellbound, the student turned to the first edition of Pineda's Tales, bound and distributed in Buenos Aires in 1956 really a gorgeous copy, a testament to the translator's lust for collecting the finest editions of the books he worked with. And yet, looking at the printed Spanish, 
the student felt she may as well have been gazing at equations not even a well-educated physicist could have solved without great sacrifice to his domestic life or personal health. Had she imagined this sudden impression of fluency? No. Looking back at the translator's manuscript, she felt once again the pure transparent ease of comprehension which momentarily she had feared was a fabrication of some early stage of dementia or drunkenness. And glancing back reluctantly at the copy of Cuentos Fríos, she found Piñera's Spanish had resumed its frustrating opacity, like a smile whose teeth were covered in blood. Now, the following day, this student spoke of her experience with her friends who, although they understandably doubted her at first, one by one experienced the same phenomenon of sudden understanding of the translator's manuscript and ongoing puzzlement before Pineda's ostensibly identical text. And although he became the stuff of legend at the literature department of the university, the strange man had drowned himself the previous evening around nine in some sorry Parisian canal, believing himself a failure. Uh, I wrote that story after having a pretty funny experience uh, while translating uh, parts of a book by Marcel Schwab, in which I was translating, I, I, it was going so well, uh, everything was flying out as fast as it could. I felt like I wasn't even having to think. And uh, I was thinking like, wow, this is the perfect translation. Like, I'm the best translator in the world. And then I looked at what I was writing and it turned out I was just copying down the French from the original. And uh, I hadn't even brought it into English. So I realized then that uh, so there's something to be said about the translation that happens in the mind of one, of the translator, I guess. And that to me struck me as a kind of perfect translation. Um, and this is the last story uh, that I'll read which I wrote on February 12th, 2019, long before COVID uh, locked us in our respective houses yeah. and on my birthday. Um, and it was about uh, the dog I had just adopted, who is now currently sleeping on the couch over there, snoring, uh, as she loves to do and does prolifically. Um, and it was, uh, I was dealing with a lot of issues of responsibility, so I'm sure that will come through. 30th birthday story. It was my 30th birthday and for all intents and purposes, things were going well. I was relatively content with my life, loved my friends and family and felt ready to shed the various skins I'd worn throughout my twenties. To celebrate, I treated myself to a big lunch at home letting myself eat all the foods I love so much, but which given a certain autoimmune condition I suffer from, provoke serious digestive problems if I eat them too often. Candies and donuts and other bready, sugary delights, a big fat cheeseburger. Everything in excess can kill you, my mom's boyfriend told me when I was in high school, even cheeseburgers. It was my dog Zochi's birthday too, who knows when she was actually born? I found her on the street, but I decided for festivity's sake to share the date with her. So I bought her a steak and cooked it up with a lot of salt. I cut it up into little bits and with my housemates, fed them to her, repeating phrases of encouragement like, Feliz cumpleaños, Sochi, and muy bien, Sochi, muy bien. Afterwards, she licked my pant leg happily, expecting more steak. Sochi's first year in the house had been, to put it optimistically, full of learning experiences for the both of us. Under her unceasing cloud of mayhem, I had suffered the casualties of one laptop, only a year and a half old, two pairs of cowboy boots, one of the toes of which she chewed clean through, one of which simply disappeared, my favorite jacket, which he had somehow opened a drawer to locate and destroy, as well as a first edition of Anne Koala's Screwball, a book I had translated into English, inscribed with a two-page letter to me from Anne herself, which she wrote to me while visiting my apartment in Mexico City when we met for the first time. I would have to write a whole book just to convey to you the wreckage. 
But these losses aside, I had to admit Sochi had been a positive addition to my life, a grounding and constant force of mutual love and attention in my home. And there we were, celebrating our birthdays together on the couch. I felt the happiness of a 30-year-old, and she felt the happiness of a one-year-old. I could hear it in her snores. Around three in the afternoon, I got a knock at the door. This seemed strange to me because I wasn't expecting anyone. Moreover, I told my friends that I wanted to spend the afternoon alone as a gift to myself and had gone so far as to tape up a no visitors sign on my front door. Even so, the knock came again, a bit more insistent this time. Sochi woke up and waddled over to the door, clumsily whiffing at the air. Putting down my notebook, I walked over too, feeling interrupted and opened up. What I saw was peculiar, though I can't say I was entirely surprised. Before me stood three of myself, although none was exactly me. There was myself at 20, all mopey and poetic, and alongside him, introverted and overexcited myself at 10. Then, in a little wheeled incubator, which the child was diligently pushing along, equipped with tubes and the rhythmic beeping of his tiny heartbeat, there was myself at precisely zero, a little blue-eyed fetus on life support, looking ready to be delivered. I didn't know what to say, but before I had time to decide on a strategy, I found myself out of habit, inviting them in. Their entrance was awkward, as were my efforts at hosting. We all had trouble making sense of how to move together through my narrow kitchen while introducing ourselves and exchanging niceties. The 10-year-old tripped on the raised lip of the living room's threshold, causing the baby in that scientific contraption to plop over onto his face and scream into the fabric, all tangled up in wires and tubes. The beeping was getting faster and no one knew what to do. The three clarified that they themselves were hardly acquainted until we just decided to kind of jiggle the cart until the fetus had flipped back over onto his back and his heartbeat had resumed its normal speed. Finally, after another minute or so of cordialities and nervous laughter, I asked them why they had come. In the meantime, I had actually become quite curious. Call me Aegis, but I had assumed that the one of myself who was going to do the talking was the 20 year old, but the one who opened his mouth first to speak was the 10 year old. He used the word random a lot and many other words he claimed to have invented such as noodle bunker, which apparently referred to a sort of winged dragon he had invented and other terms I felt I'd known at some point but had since forgotten. His sentences often exploited alliteration, which he emphasized by raising his voice at each repeated consonant. Kit, we've come calling because, curiously, you couldn't possibly conceive the consequences of your actions. Excuse me, I asked mocking his stupid way of speaking. Don't mock, young Christopher, added the 20-year-old with a wink. Yes, your 60-year-old self sent us to say something serious. He said you simply must know. Okay, well, I said, I'm ready when you are. There are three things he thought Oh, sweet infant, cried the 20-year-old, whose way of speaking was as sad, maudlin, and falsely poetic as the 10-year-old was cloying and insufferable. While you orate so, our honeyed hours do while away. Until the end of our lofty, brazen existences, that boy would breathe such breaths, like consonants, phrases, never arriving at slaking of any curiosity whatsoever. So pretty, on to my own back, allow me to raise such responsibility. But first, assure my fruit-like heart that you, your fruit-like self, shall ripen with the responsibility of knowing what I'm to tell you. Yeah, yeah, I said, that seems fine. Seems, 
I know not seems a firmer agreement, a handshake firm, I say, as John Clare would have had it. I sighed and extended my arm, already tired of the clown show, and shook hands with my 20-year-old self. He motioned toward the 10-year-old, whose hand I also shook. A strong handshake for such a saccharine little kid. Then he motioned toward the fetus as well. What? I have to shake the fetus's hand too, I asked. The 20 year old me nodded gravely and so she stirred from sleep, but he's completely sealed away in there. This time he shrugged and motioned again. So she cocked her head as I walked over to the medical case. I started kind of stroking, how else to say it, uh, stroking his container uncomfortably and looked down at the face I had 30 years ago to the day, soft and red in its lack of experience. Sochi started growling. And I looked at the 20 year old to see if he accepted my gesture. He nodded in approval and I sat back down. Are we ready? I asked. Yes, now, said my 20 year old self. The first thing of which we've been informed. At first it was just a confused yipping but Zochi's sounds quickly twisted into an uncontrollable howl. She had never much known how to deal with company at home, especially that of strangers. And as her excitement built, her need for physical expression exceeded that body of hers with its little coordination. She flopped over on her back and began heaving loud breaths, the air catching in her throat. The 10-year-old started to laugh at her, then Zochi began to buck, sprinting in insane circles around my living room, colliding with glasses and bottles, tubes of paint and books, throwing my papers to the floor. And before we could stop her, she had knocked the fetus's container to the ground and begun chewing on its wires. In her mouth, the wires snapped. And in the moments I spent before fading entirely out of consciousness, I heard the beeping of the fetus's heartbeat become a constant drone. And I saw the 20 year old version of myself poof into a cloud of dust and blow away. And I watched the 10 year old wither too, repeating the sound of the letter K. And I watched the fetus grow up and up and up as I felt my own self crumpling as if the breath were being vacuumed from my lungs, aging until he had come to replace myself at 30, a naked, hairy adult bodies stuffed into that medical apparatus meant for bodies just ready to, to be delivered into this world. My nose and cheeks and lips hardly recognizable as they squished up against the glass like a little kid making funny faces. And that's all I got. Thank you so much for, for listening. Wow, thank you so much, Kit. Uh, we are all here applauding and appreciating. Thank you for that reading um, and for giving us so many deeply rich things to um, imbibe and swim through and think about and hopefully discuss a little when we get to that portion of our evening. But before we dive there, without further ado, I am so pleased to uh, introduce our second guest, Cristina Rivera Garza. Born in Mexico and a resident of the United States for over two decades, Rivera Garza is a prolific and multifaceted author of fiction, essays, and scholarship, including nearly 20 works in Spanish. Those words are from a citation by the MacArthur Fa Foundation last year in 2020 when she was awarded the MacArthur Fellowship, also known as the MacArthur Genius Award. Um, you may have heard me cheering when that happened. I was so excited for this well-deserved praise, um, which goes on to say her novels are deeply informed by her training as a historian and frequ frequently feature characters who stumble upon images, texts, or people that disturb the supposed clarity of the historical record. Three of Rivera Garza's acclaimed six novels have appeared in the US. Most recently, The Taiga Syndrome, translated by Suzanne Jill Levine and Aviva Khanna. Um, no One Will See Me Cry, translated by Andrew Hurley. And The Iliac Crest, 
translated by Sarah Booker, which some people in this room might remember from um, classes that I've taught here at this creative writing MFA program, where we've had such fruit fruitful discussions about that beautiful work. And within this past year, Rivera Garza's complete poems were published in Spanish, um, La Fractura Exacta, Poesía Completa, in Chile from Ediciones Libros del Cardo. And three remarkable books of nonfiction have also appeared in the US in English translation, including Grieving, Dispatches from a Wounded Country, translated also by Sarah Booker. Um, Rivera Garza is on the faculty at the University of Houston. And, and since 2016, she is Distinguished Professor of Hispanic Studies and Creative Writing. And as a final note, this is not Rivera Garza's first time visiting the Poetry Center. Um, she did so twice in the early aughts, um, and I am imagining that that was in person for, in a very pre-pandemic way. So we would like to say, Cristina Rivera Garza, welcome back and welcome home. Please join me in welcoming Cristina. ¿Qué tal? ¿Qué tal? Gracias. That, that was wonderful. Thank you so much for uh, that introduction, Carolina. Muchas gracias. Buenas noches a todos. Um, Kit, that was absolutely wonderful. Thank you for that reading. I am very pleased, very happy to be here sharing this event with all of you. Thank you, Steve, for the invitation once again. Indeed, I, I was at the Poetry Center some uh, years ago, um, reading poetry, I remember, having a, a wonderful time and, and uh, great conversations. So thank you, thank all of you for um, this hospitality. Um, y buenas noches a todos, por supuesto. Gracias por compartir estos momentos también aquí con nosotros. Um, I, what I'm going to be doing tonight, I decided to, to read some um, poetry. Um, it seems fitting, uh, reading at the Poetry Center. And I don't get uh, a lot of opportunities to actually do poetry readings. So I decided to take advantage of this invitation and, and do so. I am going to be reading some um, pieces of um, my early work uh, in Spanish, although they are way more recent work in English. The translation has been um, um, more, more recent. And uh, I'll read a couple of poems included in, in the book Grieving that Carolina mentioned, uh, and uh, some two or three poems from um, uh, some um, um, work in progress. So let's see how this works. Um, some of you might know that for a number of years, uh, the F word in, uh, in Mexico uh, was uh, feminism, feminists. Um, if you were called uh, a feminist, very bad things might have happened to you. Um, and it, obviously, uh, with the rising number of femicides, uh, the growing violence against women, uh, um, feminism has become one of the most powerful imaginative uh, energetic movements uh, in Mexico and throughout the Spanish speaking world. I wrote this poem a while ago, uh, uh, back then when no one uh, dared to call um, feminism out. So this is called the feminism, the, uh, the feminists. Um, and something that you should know going into this poem is um, um, about the Santa Ana winds, which uh, I mentioned in this text. They are strong, extremely dry downslope winds that originate inland uh, and affect coastal Southern California and Northern Baja California. Known as devil winds, Santa Anas are infamous for fanning regional wildfires. The Santa Ana winds that I'm referring to here um, were experienced in a city that I that I find that I love and I find uh, fascinating, Tijuana, in uh, on the border on the U.S.-Mexico border. They enunciated the word, celebrated it, spit it out. They run away with it. Right behind this word, you should hear the wind blowing. 
They spoke against the grain, interrupting one another, oh, so shamelessly. They lived out in the open, which is the same place where they felt. I assume they were born that way. They didn't know anything about shelters, roofs, protection, patronage. Everything hurt them. And everything here means history, air, the present, the context, the subjunctive, the splitting. Agnostic rather than atheist, striking rather than beautiful, vulnerable rather than rickety, lively, more than you, more than myself. Stoic rather than strong, blissful rather than blessed. Intolerant, yes, indeed, sometimes. Did I already mention they were brutal? They walked carelessly in the cantankerous city as true muses of themselves. These mostly happened in early winter when the Santana winds blew back and forth Tijuana avenues, dragging discarded plastic wraps and the dust that forced you to close your eyes and foreclose reality. By the edge of the edge, swaying, they were the last drop clinging from the mouth of the bottle, the mythical drop, mythical drop of happiness or the prover proverbial tipping point of sex impenetrable in the sameness of its orifice. And they spilled over the worst and the waste, the epitome, the very last straw. Beneath those words, you should be able to smell the reek of the wind. I assume they only became that way over time. With men or without them, they kissed labiodentally. They moved out quite often and changed their socks and prepared rice. They climbed down the stairs and took taxis and felt no compassion. They said, this is the wind that cleanses it all and enunciated the word, emphatic, tenacious, prehuman, categorical, yes quite often poignant rather than hallucinating, sibling rather than conscious, surreptitious rather than critical, hypertextual, plain spoken. I'm sure I already said they were brutal. They smoked unequivocally. They turned pages with the devotion and the minimalist care of those in love. They were always in love. In the very dry days of the Santana winds, they faced the sky up and observed. They could spend entire hours that way. Those birds that above their heads surmounted the antagonism of the air lucidly. And the Santana winds right here, right now, you should hear the word messed up their thick, surely heads of hair once and again, the word their gory eyelashes, once and again and again, the word. Let me try another one of these poems. Um, here it is, borderline personality. Some weep, some run into madness, some forget their names or go by new names. Some become thinner than air. Some turn religious, some categorically deny the existence of God, some pray, and some even kneel. Some curse, although it looks as though they are praying. Some live inside the fishbowl of complete deafness. Some covet the word nowhere if it comes in blue. Some do wonder. It might happen everywhere, at a movie theater when light isn't real before a cashier what handling change on their longest sky, a mist naked beautifully long bodies at the beach at the date when in love or out of love, while planning self-inflicted murder in the way to work or in the way back from work, while taking a piss in perfectly symmetrical pink tile bathrooms. 
It might happen any time. Every hour is propitious. Often in the morning when vertical sunlight shafts anemic blood through Venetian blinds. But surely in the evening when reality becomes mirage, thing in itself, slippery, inclined. Always at night, through sleep or lack of sleep, when language expands and clocks arrest time. It triggers amnesia, insomnia, aphasia, bulimia, anorexia, nervous breakdowns, unmotivated laughter, sudden itch in peculiar places, mental warm-like tremors inside hands, purple eyelashes, raccoon eyes, saggy breasts and thighs, ugliness in countless formats, onion-like faces so transparent and tense and perky and dejected, they induce fear of pity or diversely varied forms of human awe. Some are found in corners, chewing fingernails while staring at walls, counting fingers and forgetting numbers, sweating, brushing rusted blades and wrists ever so softly. Some become guerrilla, guerrilla warriors, avid Marxist anarchists, artists. Some actually disguise pain and talk of calla lilies in exotic lands. Some might even pass for normal men and normal women. Some turn out to be gracious. Some turn out to be dead, very dead, bloodless and pale and still jolting. Some are looking for that corner. Some actually run three miles or nine miles a day to get to that corner. They talk themselves out endlessly. They silence themselves in endlessly. They suffer from stomach aches, lack of air, too many languages, migraine, violent shyness, good manners and bad manners, discrimination, asthma, palpitation, stereotypes, too many languages, bad breath, splintered bones, lowness of wit, heaviness of heart, ill memory, acne, too many languages. They suffer endlessly. They injure themselves endlessly. They talk to trees in tree language and to grass in grass language and to women in the feminine tide of language and to man in the feminine hooks of language. They live in Babylon and Alexandria and New York and Tijuana. They live in two countries at once. They oscillate, bounce, leap, fly and fly back, jump and jump back. They are here and they are not here. They are there and here and not there. They speak themselves in the third person plural as metaphor. They dance on the head of a pen. They know reckless gravity. Let me see. Um, I'm going to read the first poem in um, engraving, uh, the claimant, La Reclamante, in Espanol. Um, this is a documentary poem that I wrote based on um, on a news I read um, a while back, it was 2010, uh, the, the journalist Sandra Rodriguez wrote this note and um, I was just so taken by it, by what she was describing. And I just decided to use her words and uh, use the words of Luz Maria Davila, a woman who, whom, uh, with whom I later uh, spoke and um, had a, a very touching, important conversation, personally speaking. It's included also in, in grieving um, the claimant. Excuse me, Senor Presidente, for not extending my hand. You are not my friend, my friend. I cannot welcome you. You are not welcome. No one is. Luz Maria Davila, Villas de Salvarcar mother of Marcos and Jose Luis Piña Davila, 19 and 17 years old. It isn't fair. My little boys were at a party and they were killed. Massacre of Saturday, January 30th in Ciudad Juarez, Chihuahua, 15 deaths. 
Because here in Ciudad Juarez, put yourself in my place, Villas de Salvarca, my bag, my fulminance, paradox. For two years, they've been committed, committing murders. They are committing many things. To commit is a shining verb, a radiant vertigo, a lethargic tremor. They are committing many things and no one does anything. And I only wanted there to be justice. And not only for my two boys, the death distressed, the fulminous massacred, the shining lost ones, but for everyone, justice to confront, spit out, claim, accuse, demand, call for, require, defend. Don't tell me, of course, do something. If your child had been killed, you could leave no stone unturned looking for the murderer under the rocks, under rocks, under. But because I don't have the resources, arms for the birds, my bones, my flesh, from your flesh, my flesh, put yourself in my place, put yourself my shoes, my nails, my stellar shiver. I can't look for them because I don't have resources. I have the death of my two sons. Biaktor, burial in open sky, that literally means give alms to the birds. I have my back, my tear, my hammer. I don't have justice. Put yourself in their place, Villas de Salvarca, there where they killed my two sons. You are not my friend. This is the hand I do not extend to you. Put yourself, Senor Presidente, in your place. I give you my back, my thirst. I give you my unknown shiver, my distressed tenderness, my shining birds, my death. And the short woman with the blue sweater left the room, wiping away her tears. Let me see. These, these are more recent ones. These are um, um, uh, the ones that I uh, described earlier as a uh, work in progress. I'm just going to read three of them. This is an excavation from a book I, I was um, reading not long ago, Against the Grain by James Scott. Um, I, uh, there are some very interesting arguments there against the state. And I guess that's the reason why um, it caught my attention. And uh, the language in the book was just um, luxurious. It was um, very material. I had just um, published the uh, Autobiografia del Algodón, Autobiography of Cotton. And I've been doing some research about um, um, plants, about cultivars and um, um, crops. Uh, and so, that's an additional reason why this book was so interesting to me. So I began uh, writing these, these, uh, these poems, um, just organizing this excavation. Domus, a concentration of teal fields, seed and grain stores, people, domestic animals, all co-evolving co with consequences we could not have possibly foreseen. Domestication from domus or household. The commensals, sparrows, mice, rats, crows, dogs, pigs, and cats. The microparasites, fleas, ticks, leeches, mosquitoes, lice, and mites. Not a single critter emerged from its sojourn at the late Neolithic multi species resettlement camp, unaffected. Our austere monastery, meticulous, demanding, interlocked, mandatory, the annual and daily routines of our domus, 
Field clearing by fire, plow, harrow, sowing, weeding, watering, in constant vigilance as the crop ripened, harvest set itself another sequence of routines, cutting, bundling, threshing, gleaning, the separation of straw, winnowing, chaff, sieving, drying, sorting, our women's work, pounding, grinding, fire making, cooking, and baking. The background musical beat uh, of the domus. Once we took that fateful step into agriculture, we entered an austere monastery whose taskmaster consisted of the demanding genetic clockwork of a few plants, wheat and barley, the metronome of our own crops. Civilization a contraction of our species attention to and practical knowledge of the natural world, a contraction of diet, a contraction of space, a contraction in the breath of a ritual life. And let me just uh, finish with uh, some sections of the last poem, the last text included in grieving. By the way, I didn't mention this. I should mention that this is a translation by Sarah Booker. And I've been just so fortunate to work very closely with Sarah in several translations. Now I think she reads my mind and um, the work has been very enriching. Keep writing. Because we become social in language, my I for you, your you for me, our you all for them because writing by nature invites us to consider the possibility that the world can in fact be different because the secret mechanism of writing is imagination because Samantha is hunt here that clearly reads, writing exists out there right in front of you as you walk about the world because imagination is another word for criticism and this the other word for subversion. Because memory, because writing teaches us that nothing is natural, things are closer than they appear. Writing also tells us that because it is through the rectangular artifact we call a book that we communicate with our dead and all of the dead are our dead. Because a sentence produces memories that will be inhabited by the names of Marco and Jose Luis Pina Davila, Ciudad Juarez, Chihuahua, January 30th, 2010. Because a manta is hunt here that reads, tell them not to kill me. Because belonging is something I do through you, sentence. Because at the end of each line, there is an abyss worth tumbling into or launching yourself into or disappearing into. Because look how the verb to burst, burst out of itself. Because a line is an imprecation or a prayer. Because terror stops there when the word terror stops inscribed. Because there are voices that come from afar, from below, from be beyond. Because within books, I always greet the unfamiliar that I become so familiar with. Because a sentence produces memories that will be inhabited forever by the name of Lucila Quintanilla, Monterrey, Nuevo León, October 6, 2010. Because everything starts indeed with a sign because a paragraph is an extreme sport. Because while the violence invades and acquires unprecedented forms, contemporary language has difficulty giving it plausible names. Martin and Brian Almanza, Nuevo Laredo, Reynosa, Matamoros, April, 2010. Because Amanta is hung here, uh, with the story of the woman who makes paper flowers to bring to the cemetery at the end of every month, waiting for justice, demanding justice. Because yes, it's a small and sacred and savage word all at the same time. 
because I'm sorry, I'm, I got lost. Because a sentence produces uh, memories that will be inhabited forever by the name of Liliana Rivera Garza, Mexico City, July 16, 1990. Because Samantha is hung here that reads, we're a country in mourning. Because I do not forget, because I will not forget, because we will never forget. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christina, for that incredible, powerful reading and for bringing us the, that poetry. And welcome back, Kit, to our virtual stage. Um, and now that we're all three of us together on stage fully for the first time, I just want to say again, thank you so much for joining us here at the Poetry Center and virtually at San Francisco State Campus tonight. Thank you for bringing your words and your thoughts. And um, I have so many questions that we could explore. Um, but one thing that's really striking me from um, this poem that you read, Christina, is um, belonging is something I do through you sentence. If I heard that right? Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, sí. Mm -hmm. yeah sí, verdad que sí. <laughs> and <laughs> let me just say it too. Bien, bienvenidos, bienvenides, bienvenidex <laughs> to, to our space. Um, yeah, so that is so powerful, this belonging. We do it through you, the sentence. Um, and I'm wondering if you could speak more about that. And I also want to notice um, a very beautiful uh, interplay here that you're both writers who work cross borders, inhabit inter, inter, interlingual spaces. Um, Cristina, as a Mexican writer living in the United States and working here for two decades. Um, Kit, as a US American writer living and working in Mexico City and also in that in-between space of the translator. Um, belonging is something I do through you sentence. How does that, how does that come alive for you as a writer? This is a question for each of you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Carolina. Um, yeah, I think one of the most defining elements in my writing has definitely been uh, migration, living in the United States. I've been um, writing uh, most of my work um, from within the United States. Most of my work, uh, of course, it, it is in Spanish. So there is always this um, kind of um, um, hesitation, uh, this out of placeness in, in many ways. Um, and, and so trying to, to build that sense of belonging has been extremely important. And obviously these, this is built um, uh, through very specific and material relationships with the specific communities that I, that I belong to uh, in both countries and across these countries. I think in many ways, I am um, constantly trying to participate in conversations that I believe have uh, weight that uh, that um, that they might as they transform my own life, they might also uh, affect the life of, of others. I think I'm I'm uh, uh, profoundly convinced that writing has that power, and that sentence. Um, uh, and it's so interesting the, the word in itself, in sentence and oración in español, which is you know way more. Uh, it has that religious undertone, uh, less that legal. It doesn't have that that legal element. Uh, it, it doesn't. It's not as heavy as it might appear in English. So I'm 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 constantly reminded that uh, about this this um, uh, potential mutation, uh, and and participating um, through these with uh, with communities of, of migrants that are always, I mean, we're, we're constantly uh, facing uh, the limits of this position, but at the same time, the potency of, um, of, of what it means to live in between. So I'm very much invested in, in that transition. And I guess that's, um, that's, um, that might help explain why I, I feel so closely connected to that oración to that way of um, the way in which literature or writing might become, might be, in fact, that way of, of uh, the, the, a form of communion, of being deeply, uh, truly, honestly with others. 
Yes. Oh, it's so beautiful. I'm so glad you raised that that layer about the word sentence in English can also be a life sentence. It can have yeah. that heaviness, right? Whereas yeah. oración, and I think about this obsessively that the, the word means sentence, but it also means prayer. It's the same yeah. word. So the idea that we could belong inside of or belong through it, what does it mean as artists to have it be a prayer? I, I love that you brought that forward. And it also feels an echo of um, the writer Edwidge Dandicat, the uh, Haitian US American writer has been asked, where do you feel like you belong? And she says, I belong nowhere and everywhere. I belong on the page. Um, mm. So, you know, just thinking about that as you're speaking and, and um, that this can be a, such a resonance for so many of us who are immigrant writers. Um, Kit, what about you? The sentence is, uh, um... I live in you. Could you no, repeat? The, the phrase is belonging is something I do through you. Uh, I, I, well, I love the sentence and uh, I feel perhaps I experience it differently or I would use a different preposition. Uh -huh. um, yeah. Something like uh, I belong for you or, or with you uh, and mm -hmm. um, in that sense, I feel, I feel even closer to the oration uh, of Christina's, which was live between um, a feeling that one never is quite <clears throat> oneself nor the other, uh, somehow suspended between all of these things. And this happens in, in terms that uh, she evoked with nationality, legal status, it happens uh, in ways that I think are constant psychological, emotional uh, states that, that we move through. And I think uh, as far as, as writing goes, um, uh, I, I never thought I'd be the person who, who did a Zoom reading with my books in the background, but uh, this is where the light hits right and where the internet's good. And I, I look at, at these books uh, and each spine to me represents a, an entire world, an entire possibility, an entire potential space of, of existence. <laughs> and, um, and I find myself somewhere between uh, myself and those worlds that are promised to me by, by the objects that, that I exist among, the people I exist among, who are also promises of a different existence or a different world that I feel drawn toward. Or, the spines of books or books themselves or poems themselves, I feel somehow suspended <laughs> between a kind of infinite number of, of objects and entities and beings. Uh, and I think, yeah, I, I have no idea who, who I am <laughs> in a sense or, or what I am. Um, and I think that's where writing comes in. Uh, it, it provides a definition. Uh -huh. the, the last little uh, object I'll note. The, at the beginning of Samuel Beckett's book, The Unnameable, mm -hmm. the, the narrator has no idea who he is, what he is, where he is. He's in a vast darkness, but he's crying. He, he realizes that he's crying and he, he feels the tears running over his cheeks and he feels the contours of the wetness on his cheeks. And that is how he starts to understand who he is, some kind of feeling the, uh, of the body interacting with the world and its air, things like that. I feel that was a very honest explanation of the kind of grain of, of the cell. Uh -huh. Sorry, I got quite philosophical. Yeah. Yeah, yes, philosophical is great. Philosophical is part of what we do, right? And book as a space of existence. I mean, I just want to pull forward that that really powerful thing that you said, um, that a, a book that we create in the writing of it, we think of it as a text and it lives sort of ethereally, it lives in words, it lives in language, but it's also a space of existence, right? That we can inhabit and that maybe writers, readers get to inhabit too. We get, as readers, we all get to inhabit books as a space of fuller or deeper existence as well. And of course, all of us who are writers are readers, right? Isn't that how we begin? Um, so I'm, I'm going to ask one more question and then I'm going to move towards the Q&A. So if this, if you wanted to pop a question in the chat, I mean, in the Q&A box, please feel free to do so now. This is a great time. Um, and my, my last question is just, is there any question that you might have for each other? Yes. <laughs> okay, Kit, you have a question for Christina. Yeah, uh, it has to do with the Iliac crest, um, which is 
uh, favorite book of mine, um, and which I wrote a long review of uh, that was never published because they requested a thousand word, an 800 word review, and I wrote like 5,000 words. I was, <laughs> I was so fascinated by it. And it, it led me to read Davila, and it, it, who uh, I believe Davila's translator, Matt Gleason, is here. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But anyhow, I, I was so struck by the symbolism of that book, the, the kind of, it feels like a philosophical novel. The things don't happen arbitrarily in my mind. Um, and you mentioned tonight, you mentioned feminism as the F word of Mexico. I feel like that still is something that it's continued to this day, maybe not to the same extent or within the same communities, but I, I feel like there's, there isn't as wide an acceptance of, of the movement or the, the attitude. Uh, and if I remember correctly in that book, there's a group of young feminists who are trying to revive Amparo Davila, who's this 80 something year old woman who never leaves her apartment and she lives in this terrible part of town and all this stuff. And I was so struck by the, the image of these young, almost uh, gang-like figures, these feminists who yeah. are trying to revive or, uh, Davila or get her her due to, in some extent, to some extent. And I was curious if you could talk a little bit about um, that gesture of, of this group of feminists uh, attempting to, to engage this somewhat ancient, uh, completely antisocial figure uh, who maybe yeah. didn't want to be saved or brought out into the light. Um, and I was very curious about that. I, I wonder if you could just, uh, within that space, like. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Kat, for, for that uh, question. Um, I'm, I'm going to try two, two different answers. Uh, <laughs> let's see. Um, there is this, um, what's his name? Of course, I had to forget uh, the, the, the name of this writer, um, Halal Tufik. Uh, he wrote um, about something that I've been thinking a lot about lately. Uh, what is the meaning of, of, um, of an unsurpassing, surpassing disaster? And uh, he mentioned something along the lines that um, once it, it's not uh, one of these kind of disaster is not necessarily limited to material destruction, to uh, destruction of buildings, lives, uh, libraries, etc. But it's something that is really important is um, that even though some of these subjects might remain um, out there they become um, unavailable to us, right? Mm -hmm. And so there, it, it takes a whole um, um, decision and, and, and some sort of mobilization to bring them back, to touch them. And, and for him, it was an act of almost of resuscitation, just to make those meanings that might have been lost through violence to make them available again. Uh, and, and it seems to me that that's, that, that group of women, those, those young uh, feminists in the story, were attempting something along those lines. Um, mm -hmm. I, in, it, it was, in a way, my experience. I had read Amparo Davilos when I was uh, very young. Uh, in fact, I had time to forget, to forget that I had read her uh, because no one ever mentioned her. It was one of these, uh, these writers that, that you sometimes read and, and, and then you keep to yourself because it's, it, her name, her work was not part of a longer conversation. And so um, I, I wrote, I began writing this book about these appearances, a, a range of these appearances, material and immaterial. And so I thought that that relationship with, with Amparo Davila made sense in that context. And so these, these group of women um, are, are, are facing are trying to, to, to rescue, to bring back to life, to, to make that work available again. And, and they are facing obviously all the, the kind of challenges, material and immaterial too, uh, involved in that, in that whole process. I, um, uh, I was uh, 
it is so interesting to me that even today uh, um, it is very hard uh, to read um, women. The, the women that have preceded us, uh, a very important uh, literary history of Mexico uh, belongs to women's writing. And um, even though I think there are, there are glorious efforts uh, right now being made, uh, and the, the one that comes to mind immediately, Socorro Venegas, who is a wonderful uh, writer herself, uh, as an editor of Ade Unam, has uh, begun this collection called Vindictas. And uh, she's been publishing all kinds of uh, wonderful, incredibly interesting work by, by women from the 50s, 60s and onward. So, so I think it seems to me that, that um, one of the points that I wanted to make in the book, I think, and I'm saying this after the fact that I wrote the book, I was not so sure that I was trying to make that point when, when, I, when I wrote it, of course. But um, uh, in talking about... Um, the actual material disappearances of women's bodies and the violence against women's bodies in, in, in Mexico, it is, there, there is a thin line, but it is closely connected, this, uh, this continuing uh, erasing of, of women's words and women's experience. And so the, the situation of Amparo Davila in that novel, it seemed to me there, there was a way of connecting that to do uh, what was happening when I read when I wrote the novel and what is happening uh, even today, and uh, and that's the reason why I wanted to read a poem about uh, the, the feminist because I I, I think I I owe um, I think we as a society owe to this continuous mobilization a kind of language that we didn't have access to for many many years and just to be able to identify. Uh, violence, to fight against it, uh, to identify newer ways of solidarity or hospitality among ourselves too. So um, those were my, my two takes on, on, on your question, Kit. And, and if, I, if I may, just one, I've been very curious about this for a number of years. As you mentioned, Carolina, uh, Kit has been very involved in a serious, I mean, you are a, a cultural worker, a transnational cultural worker. You've been, you've been um, uh, a very important piece in a number of projects. And I'm always hearing about, you know, what is happening here and there and all these multiple connections across borders. I had um, an uncle by marriage, um, a, a U.S. citizen who married a, a, an aunt of mine, and, and he moved to Mexico. And he was, you know, a very cool guy. But uh, once he moved to uh, he moved to Mexico, he was he always uh, he he his opinions were more measured. I, I guess they he was um, um, he essentially said that moving to Mexico was akin to euthanasia for him. Uh, and and I'm not so sure. I, I don't know if uh, if you, if uh, obviously your situation is is quite different. You've been um, uh, uh, working in all these different projects. So I'm I'm curious about that. How is that um, uh, presence in Mexico and in Spanish uh, shaped your own work? Uh, well, first of all, moving to Mexico has not been like experiencing youth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thankfully. Um, I came about four years ago and I had rudimentary Spanish. Um, so, and when I first came, I was in a, a personal place where I, I wanted to go somewhere where I kind of didn't really know many people and I could uh, sort of reset um, and study Spanish and learn Spanish. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had read a lot of work in Spanish or in translation. And I had even done one small translation of a Bolivian poet's book, Jaime Sáenz, who's really a wonderful writer. Um, but when I came here, uh, the language was spoken so much more quickly. Chilango, Mexico City slang and uh, the sort of way people speak, the words they use, is very different than what I had in the, the dictionary of my mind. And so I was kind of isolated in, in a way, which was perfect for what I was looking for. And uh, my first experiences were very 
poor conversations, <laughs> which were fun, but you know, you get you get really thrown back on your heels when you can't speak the language well. People have no idea who you are. You feel like you have to go through a somewhat long process of almost translating your personality into a new language. Mm -hmm. And that for me meant learning the local manner of speaking, the local <laughs> slang, really, the, the humor, the sense of humor, which is so particular here and uh, so self-deprecating and, and so cutting. And so I, had, I went through life kind of thinking, oh, I like that phrase. That define. I'm gonna. I want to use that phrase because it made me laugh in a way that I want to make other people laugh. Mm. Or, oh, I like the way that sounds. I'm going to incorporate it. I'm going to. I'm going to use it and see how it feels. If it didn't feel right for myself, then I, I would. I would stop using it. Or, but it was a very slow process. Now I feel I can speak perfectly fine. But uh, it also meant that I was dealing with a lot of. Uh, reading that I didn't entirely understand or completely understand 100% of 60% maybe so there was a lot of space on the page that was just empty blank projections of what I thought the author might be saying or what I hoped she might be saying or all these things and that to me is a very very important part of language a very important space of language the language that as, as one who is learning a, a language one does not understand and, and it's this kind of ideal language for me that, that the words that you don't understand on a page or that you don't grasp because you really feel in those moments that this kind of ideal space of language, this kind of maximal potential of language where, um, yeah, like it's, it's really an emotional space of language. And, and so, in my own writing, I try sometimes to create that kind of feeling within English, uh, using words in odd ways or um, yeah. sentences that don't entirely cohere. Or this, I do this more in, in what I would call poetry or prose poems, things like that, less in the kind of specifically narrative stuff. But um, that, that would be a kind of a more purely linguistic space uh, on a more cultural space. Uh, <laughs> I, I found uh, in the Latin American tradition a very, very rich, uh, adventuresome imagination uh, and an emphasis on the imagination uh, in many ways that I, I don't really find in that many U.S. American writers. Um, there, there are notable exceptions like Ricky Ducournay or even Lydia Davis or Bartholomé, people like that, and then fantasy writers. But um, I, I, I found when I was giving readings here, I wanted to be able to read things that were simpler in language, that were funnier in language, and that were slightly more entertaining. Like, uh, I don't want to be a, a showman or something, but I, I did find that the poems I'd been writing were completely opaque and, and d difficult to translate and, and just terribly, uh, not morose, but they had a morose effect on people when I would read them because they just, they were very linguistic and very labyrinthine. So I simplified things and I focused on telling a story rather than- Oh, great. It's sort of great that, you know, the, the ways in which when we go into different contexts and how cultural and linguistic contexts we can be displaced, but also kind of reinvigorated and how the art work itself can be reinvigorated as well by displacement, even when it sort of shakes us up. Um, that's so rich. Thank you so much. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, it is that this has been such an incredibly rich conversation. I feel like I could listen to each of you forever and there would be so much that would come of it. Um, unfortunately, we are actually out of time. And yeah. so those are all the questions that we have time for, <laughs> um, that we have some wonderful questions in Q&A, including from the poet Forrest Gander. Hello, Forrest Gander. And Brandon Shimoda and wonderful poets who have joined us in this community space. Thank you for being here. Um, above all, Christina and Kit, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for bringing so much of yourselves, your experiences, stories, and artfulness. Um, I also want to say before we fully close, thank you so much to Steve Dickinson at the Poetry Center for curating and leading this, Molly and Trey who've done logistics and Javier Saavedra for the closed captioning, which is such a big thing when we're all putting out all of these ideas. Mm -hmm. um, Cristina and Kit, thank you so much. Kit and Cristina. 
thank you. Mil gracias por venir. Gracias a ti. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And thank you for everyone for joining us and a very good night to everyone.